Welcome to the 53rd uh, Arbuckle Award celebration. Uh, it's great to see everyone here tonight. I'd like to welcome all of you. I'd especially like to welcome tonight's honoree, Ken Hirsch, and his friends and family members. Okay, I, I'm going to give a few opening remarks, but you should feel free to start eating. So your salads are there. Don't hold back. Uh, so the the Arbuckle. I'm going to say a few. Want to say a few things about the Arbuckle dinner, um, and this tradition. The Arbuckle dinner is a, is an important tradition at the at the GSB. It's one of the few times during the year that we bring together uh, alumni, faculty, students, staff all different members of the GSB community. And the, the, our guests tonight, all of you, are, are really a testament to the, the leaders and citizens and members of the community that have come from, from the GSB. Uh, I'd like to actually ask a few of the groups to stand for a moment to be recognized. Uh, we have a 40, I think, 39 or 40 of our students here tonight. And I'd like to ask all of the GSB students who are here to stand and be recognized. <laughs> now, one of the special features of the Arbuckle dinner, which I I think this dates back more than 30 years, is that we bring together uh, GSB students who are fellowship recipients uh, with alumni and friends of the school who have created uh, fellowships. As, as many of you probably know, just about half of the MBA students benefit from fellowship support, about 35% of our MSX class, 100% of our PhD students and we have more than 65 fellowship donors who are here tonight, and I'd like to ask all of those who are fellowship donors to stand and be recognized. Thank you for your support of the GSB students. We also have a number of past Arbuckle Award recipients who are here tonight, and I'd like to ask them to stand and be recognized. Um, I, so the first one I'm, I haven't seen yet tonight, so I'm not sure if he's here, but I believe John Lilly may be here, who would be the, who's our 1989 recipient. Is John here? I don't see John. Okay, so the next one I know is here, because I saw him earlier, our 1996 Arbuckle Award recipient from the MBA class of 1957, John Morgridge. Um, our 2012 recipient, my predecessor as Dean, Dean Emeritus Robert Joss, MBA class of 67. Our 2014 Arbuckle recipient, Bob King, MBA class of 1960. And last year's Arbuckle Award recipient, Professor Emeritus Mark Wolfson. Great. So Stanford is a very forward-looking place. Sometimes when I go and visit our peer schools in other parts of the country or the world, I like to tell them that one of our competitive advantages at Stanford is that unlike them, we are unburdened by a glorious past. That's actually not true, though. And uh, tonight's dinner and award um, celebrates a very important part of the past of the GSB. It honors the legacy of Ernie Arbuckle. And so I want to share a little bit about Ernie's uh, legacy uh, and what this award uh, means. So er Ernie Arbuckle, as many of you know, was the third dean of the GSB. He served as dean from 1958 to 1968. Um, that was a period of incredible transformation, both for Stanford and also for business education. 
and I think it's fair to say that Ernie Arbuckle was the person, uh, along with well, Sterling and some of the faculty at the school of time, who set the Graduate School of Business on a course for excellence in management education that has really endured to this day. So it was, it was during Ernie's time that there was a recognition that management education needed to be reorganized in a way that grounded the teaching in the social sciences, and there needed to be a much stronger effort to undertake rigorous research that would illuminate managerial thinking. And so it was Ernie that committed the GSB to dual excellence in research and teaching, and to an understanding those had to come together in the classroom, so faculty would confront students with frameworks and evidence, and students would confront faculty with a desire for relevance and applicability, and that would foster a creative tension, hopefully more light than heat, uh, that would improve both the way the faculty thought about problems and the way the students learned. And that's really the foundation that has persisted to this day uh, at the GSB. Ernie was also a gifted and charismatic leader of the school. And he had a very deep belief both in people as the cornerstone of organizations and in the ability of organizations to make a contribution in society. And that too continues uh, as a foundation of the school in preparing uh, students today to be leaders who can uh, navigate the challenges at the intersection of business and, and society. Like Ernie, the recipients of the Arbuckle Award are meant to be alumni and friends of the school who demonstrate a commitment both to managerial excellence and to addressing the changing needs of society. And that's why it's fitting that we've come together today to, to award the Arbuckle Award to Ken Hirsch. So we're going to hear a lot more about Ken at dessert, but I want to say a few things about him just to, as we start the, the evening. Um, Ken arrived at the GSB along with actually many people in this, uh, in this uh, tent tonight uh, in 1987. He came from Texas by way of Princeton and Morgan Stanley. Um, at the GSB, he was an R.J. Miller scholar. All of you who are students, take note. Um, and it was at the GSB that he met uh, a, f a former, another former Arbuckle Award winner and a member of the MBA class of 1968, Richard Rainwater. And Richard, as many of you know, was a, a, a tremendous, had a tremendous eye for talent. And it was along with Richard and a few others that Ken founded Natural Gas Partners and, and really pioneered a whole new era of private equity uh, investing. And that, of course, was only the first chapter in Ken's leadership. He went on, after stepping down as CEO of NGP, to be the CEO of the Bush Presidential Library. And in that role, he's made an enormous contribution uh, to this country in fulfilling the library's vision of education and engagement to create opportunity and strengthen democracy and to advance freedom around the world. And finally, I want to say a little bit about Ken's contributions to the school. So they are also remarkable. Ken served as a member of the school's advisory council for two terms, starting in 2009, running through 2015. And he has been a, 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 an advisor and a counselor to multiple deans, including me. Um, I'll just mention one, one of Ken's more recent contributions. Uh, during the pandemic, I asked Ken if he would join a task force that I was assembling to think about the intersection of business, government, and society and the changing landscape for business leaders in the current environment. And Ken played such an important role in that group in helping to shape a vision for how the GSB could really bring to bear the expertise of Stanford faculty and students and the leadership of alumni to think about the role of business in tackling some of the biggest challenges facing the world today. 
the future of, of technology, the, how to strengthen markets and institutions, how to address challenges of sustainability and climate. And Ken had one particular contribution to the task force that I wanted to emphasize, which was we met every couple of weeks for about six months. It was on Zoom because it was during the pandemic. And Ken had a, cons had a consistent and important message in those meetings, which was all about the GSB's responsibility to develop leaders who would be open-minded, who would welcome opposing views, who would be fundamentally curious, not judgmental, when confronting different perspectives, and about the role that the school can and had to play in preparing students for leadership in a world that was increasingly polarized. And that mindset was just became central to the thinking of everybody in our group and has continued to be important in all of the discussions at the school since then. And I really want to thank Ken for bringing that to the table, along with other members of this audience, actually, who are also part of that group. Uh, and um, so I want to welcome everyone again. I want to uh, congratulate Ken. And uh, I look forward to many more years of his contributions to the GSB. Um, and with that, enjoy your dinner. And we're going to pick up again uh, with the program at dessert. Good evening. Sorry to interrupt dessert, everybody. Uh, my name is Derek Bolton. I serve on Dean Levin's team leading external relations here at the GSB. It's a real privilege to welcome you all tonight uh, to honor Ken Hirsch. Uh, I have two simple tasks this evening. The first is to introduce a set of three videos that we'll hear in just a minute. And the second is to introduce Bob Jeffy, who then will introduce our honoree. Uh, but as someone who grew up in Texas, uh, I cannot let this opportunity to honor one of our uh, our most famous citizens pass. Uh, and so I thought maybe Bob Jeffy would be sick. I didn't know. Um, so I asked ChatGPT you know, to write an introduction for Ken Hirsch. And true story, Ken Hirsch is a prominent American philanthropist, businessman, and nonprofit leader. He's widely recognized for his leadership in investing in sports, his remarkable contribution to various philanthropic causes, and his dedication to making a positive impact in society. Hirsch is known for his strategic approach to problem solving and for his commitment to meet, meet, meeting sustainable solutions to social and environmental issues. He's been recognized with numerous awards and honors for his contributions to philanthropy and business leadership. By the way, I asked it uh, to write an introduction for Derek Bolton and it said, nice try, maybe GPT-9. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, but when I think of Ken, um, I, I think of someone who's built an amazing business, who's led an amazing family. And actually, John, John asked a few people to stand up tonight, but I just am curious, how many of you came in from Texas for this evening? Would you all stand up? Stand. Yeah. Like, and that's a pretty amazing legacy uh, to, to make the trip to be out here for this event. Um, I think this, this location, by the way, is especially appropriate. Uh, directly behind me is the Bass Center, uh, which was made possible by Bob Bass, MBA class of 74. And if you know Bob, he was very involved in the, the details of that building. Uh, in front of us is the class of 68 building, uh, made possible by Richard Rainwater, MBA class of 68. And Ken truly belongs in the company of those amazing individuals and leaders. And it's a real privilege to, to have him here tonight. Uh, so uh, now we have a brief video. Uh, these will feature Secretary of Commerce Don Evans, uh, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, and President George W. Bush. And I looked at the videos and I thought, these are three people who are really sharp, uh, really great leaders. And they heard the words atmospheric river and tent and said, uh, we'll do a video. So, uh, so we'll, we'll see those now. Well, to my great friend, Ken Hirsch, on behalf of the board of directors of the George W. Bush Foundation and all the colleagues that we work with there and the hundreds of thousands of supporters of the Bush Center, we salute you and we congratulate you for receiving this prestigious 
2023 Arbuckle Award. Your extraordinary leadership, your inspiring vision, a strategic plan that you put in place years ago has taken us to new heights. There's no question about the fact that the Bush Center now is one of the most trusted voices in America when it comes to public policy discussion. So Ken, congratulations, you've done a fabulous job and I look forward to continuing to work with you in all the years ahead. God bless. Ken, I'm so really happy to have an opportunity to congratulate you on the Arbuckle Award. Uh, you exemplify what it means, uh, managerial excellence, and of course, your tremendous impact on uh, the world at large. Uh, thanks so much for everything you do, and again, congratulations. Lauren, I congratulate Ken Hirsch on receiving the Ernest C. Arbuckle Award. Ken's a longtime friend, and we're lucky to have him at the helm of the Bush Center. The work that Ken is leading at the Bush Center to promote leadership is improving lives at home and abroad. I'm grateful for his steady leadership. Ken, Laura, and I applaud you for this well-deserved accolade. Okay, and, uh, and now to introduce Bob Jeffy. Uh, Bob serves as senior operating partner at Blackwatch, which is a merchant bank that invests and advises in the clean tech and fintech spaces. Uh, he also is a vice chairman of uh, Sono Group, which uh, is, sorry, hard to read, a solar electric vehicle manufacturing company. Uh, he's an amazing philanthropic leader. Um, he was a founder of the first Western Medical University in Tanzania and started a fellowship program for uh, healthcare professional leaders in Central America. Uh, Bob received his MBA from the GSB in 1974, graduating as an R.J. Miller Scholar. I will add to John's note for students in the room. Uh, he also went to Dartmouth College undergrad and graduated summa cum laude there. Uh, spent nearly 35 years as an investment banker, which translates to 245 human years. Uh, the first 20 years were at Morgan Stanley in New York. I served as head of the Global Energy Group, uh, head of the corporate finance team, and as a member of the Investment Banking Management Committee. Uh, for the next seven years, he led energy, natural resources, and power groups at, at Citibank and Credit Suisse. Uh, he joined GE in 2001 as senior vice president running corporate development as a board member of GE Capital. He did that for about three years until the banking lure pulled him back, and he spent seven years as chairman of corporate advisory at Deutsche Bank. Uh, he's a director of Associated Bank, which is based in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, I noted that he is the chair of the audit committee and a member of the risk committee and strategic committees, and gosh, we wish you'd had you on those committees at Silicon Valley Bank, uh, because he is uh, really good at the work that he does. Uh, he's a longtime member of the GSB Advisory Council. He's co-chaired several reunions for his class. Uh, I know him from my time at admission when he was an enthusiastic and most importantly persuasive admission volunteer. Uh, and he's been a perennial participant in the GSB's Executive Challenge, which he actually helped the school to launch uh, as part of his volunteer efforts around the Center for Leadership Development. So, Bob, come on up. Yes, uh, <clears throat> I, I almost feel like I need to call an audible here after uh, those kind of introductions following uh, President Bush and Condoleezza Rice and Don, Don Evans. But nevertheless, uh, it is a great honor for me to introduce the recipient uh, this year, Ken Hirsch. I first met Ken in 1985 when he joined Morgan Stanley as a new analyst. Ken had been, had been highly touted. We, we hired a couple hundred analysts a year, and he was, he was viewed as one of the creme de la creme at the time. He was a top honors graduate, as we've heard, from Princeton. He was editor-in-chief of the school's highly successful uh, national publication, Business Today, which had a circulation of 250,000 uh, subscribers. We, we had really high expectations. We thought we'd, we had recruited a superstar. Um, Ken loves baseball. I love baseball. We thought we had Mike Trout. 
But we didn't know. It could have been, there's a guy in Texas everyone thought was going to be better than Mike Trout. His name is David Clyde, and he pitched one brilliant game, but that was about it. But Ken, Ken is, uh, he was not a professional baseball player, but he, he is a part owner of the Texas Rangers. And he played a major role in the planning of the new ballpark in Texas. Ken, Ken does so many things so well, and if you go there, you'll be impressed. In the energy group at Morgan Stanley, I had the opportunity to work intensively with Ken on a really complicated transaction, uh, the famous uh, Texaco Pennzoil battle. And th this took a lot of time. It was, there were a lot of uh, intensive hours, uh, round the clock, uh, tough legal and financial situation, many twists and turns for you know, probably lots of, there were newspaper articles every day about this. But nevertheless, Ken, Ken quickly established himself as a new analyst as the critical modeler, which he should have been doing this for Silicon Valley Bank, but uh, he did one hell of a job on this. And ultimately, Texaco, which at the time was one of the largest companies in the world, had to file for bankruptcy, and they paid the largest financial settlement in history up to that time. During this process, Ken, Ken demonstrated uh, financial acumen, and judgment that was extraordinary for a first-year analyst. And I, I got to watch it firsthand. He grasped all the critical issues and he offered ideas, strategic ideas, as if he were a partner of Morgan Stanley. And I, I, I mean, that's, if you talk to anyone in the group, we, they all would agree with that. He exhibited tenacity, energy, leadership, and teamwork. He clearly was gonna be Mike Trout. He, continue, he was continuing his life path of enormous success. At Princeton, before when he joined us, he was a leader, a top student. He was editor-in-chief of the newspaper, and this is before Princeton, and head debater at St. Mark's School in Dallas. And this, this thing, I didn't know this fact until I read his book, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, Ken even found time to work long hours and drive to McDonald's at the age of 15. And I, I didn't even know you could do that, but he, he did it. After Morgan Stanley, uh, he, he of course uh, went to the GSB, was an R.J. Miller scholar. And I still, and I know uh, John was talking about this, I, I think it's still incredible, and through the help of one of my colleagues, a fellow named Tom Hassan, he uh, got in touch, he was working at McKinsey and got in touch with uh, a group in Fort Worth and he put together the business template of what became Natural Gas Partners in his summer job. And during his second year, while he was a full-time student, he became a co-founder of NGP. This is while he was a student. During his time as the managing partner at NGP, the firm, and Ken always emphasized the firm, uh, achieved a 30% compounded rate of return over 27 years in spite of some pretty wild oil and gas price gyrations, which happen all the time. Ken and his partners were pace setters in establishing uh, leadership principles and creative financial structures in the highly competitive private equity uh, energy business. More importantly, with the emphasis on the firm, they created a culture of transparency and teamwork and consciously overshared equity. Not surprisingly, there was virtually no turnover. Along with his founding partners, Ken engineered a thoughtful and successful handoff to the new leaders of NGP. And of course, Ken then turned to his next phase of his life as the president and CEO of the George W. Bush Presidential Center. Ken has followed his core principles uh, of leadership at the Bush Center as a compassionate uh, conservative he is creating a sustainable future for the center, which uh, is dedicated to freedom, democracy, and capitalism. And under Ken's leadership, the center has been successful in raising a $325 million endowment. Before closing my brief remarks, I want to come back to these books. Uh, I just finished two books on two outstanding Stanford GSB graduates, or not graduates, but leaders. One never graduated. That's not Ken. Uh, one is a biography of uh, John Kennedy by Mark Updegrove. 
who is the head of the LBJ Center in, uh, in Austin, Texas. And Ken introduced me to Mark, and that's how I got, I uh, became interested in what he does. The second book is an autobiography by Ken Hirsch. So we got John Kennedy, and we have Ken Hirsch. Ken's book, and it, it's, a, it's a fast read. It's a really good book. It's titled The Fastest Tortoise. And it's an excellent review of his life and his career, and has many humble insights on the ingredients of leadership and success. With pleasure, I am honored to introduce the outstanding Arbuckle Award winner of 2023, Ken Hirsch. I made him put this riser up here so I could stand a little bit taller. <laughs> I used to carry one around with me. Um, So uh, before I get started, I want to thank Dean Levin and Derek and the incredible team here at Stanford and the Arbuckle family, uh, as well as the past honorees. Um, being uh, on the same list as you all is very humbling. And I want to thank Bob, Bob Jeffy. Um, you've known me a long time. You were my boss's boss's boss in my first job out of college <laughs> in 1985. You were old then, no, sorry, that's a different speech. Um, I ran numbers for you, I put them into presentations, I collated them, I delivered them to you, and thankfully you rarely checked my work. <laughs> and I really appreciated your trust. Um, really, it meant something to me and I, and I felt good. I said, wow, he's not even really checking this. Um, in fact, it was that trust that allowed me to proudly present you with a pitch deck right before a big meeting not for a client's initial public offering, but rather in a time before spell check and grammar check, a bold-faced pitch for an initial pubic offering. <laughs> a lesson in proofreading that I will never forget. <laughs> Thanks for not firing me on the spot. Um, those who are here who work for me now know where my incredible uh, angst about uh, proofreading came from. <laughs> you know who you are. Um, then, some 20 years later, I tried to hire you, Bob, um, twice, um, and you turned me down. Um, and so those are lessons to all the students here. Keep an eye on your next boss, because he or she may make a great employee someday. Um, and as to the many folks who used to work for me, as you go build your empires, please don't forget about me. Um, I'm still around. When Dean Levin called me about this, um, I was flabbergasted, to put it mildly. Um, it's not something that I would have even put my name out there for. In fact, I think if you threw a dart um, in this tent, you could find many honorees. Um, and I was speechless. And for those closest to me, you know how not normal that is. Um, I, I was reminded by the not-so-great Lee Grosscup, who played backup quarterback for the New York Giants and the New York Titans. 1960 to 1962. He played in 16 games in his entire career. He had a 4-12 and 12 terrible record. He had more interceptions than touchdowns. Years later, at a dinner, and he was being touted as a former NFL quarterback, and he said, you know, the older you get, the greater you were. <laughs> and I kind of feel that way. Um, why am I here? Uh, did y'all really need a Texas private equity guy made a, who made a living in oil and gas? Was it our turn? Um, did, you, did, did, uh, did you need to find a conservative? So you looked at the Bush website and my name popped up. I am humbled and confused because, heck, I'm not even the most distinguished person in my amazing accomplished class, who I would say we got COVIDed out of our reunion, so this is a mini reunion, and if I can be the excuse, that's awesome. But in the class of 89, I am not the smartest. Um, we named a building after that guy, Bill Patterson, and we miss him tremendously. Um, and he was a dear classmate and a dear friend. Um, I'm not the most interesting. Gary Kremen has that slot nailed. I'm not the coolest. We had Wade Wennington in our class. I'm not the most intimidating. We were all scared of Kim Persky. I'm not devoting the time to teach here, like Mahold and Kelly. I'm not even the best oil and gas guy. T 
Tim Ling, who had a distinguished career, who we also lost at a very young age, um, was amazing in the industry. Stanford doesn't owe me, like Andy and Sylvia Thompson, who with five Stanford kids have been paying at least one tuition here for the last 25 years. <laughs> and, and of course, I haven't changed the world like our classmate Bill Browder, who has not only led a social justice campaign about kleptocracy, but he succeeded in pissing off Vladimir Putin in a way only Browder could do. <laughs> it's with so many accomplished people just in our class, I feel like being a part of this group is the privilege. And it's really important for me to keep striving to do the group justice. I didn't want to be the one not pulling my weight. So I'll just say that I'll accept this on behalf of the incredible class of 1989. How's that? Um, It, it is an honor to be in this community, and it is even more special to welcome my two great kids, Daniel and Rachel, here at the GSB. Daniel is a first year, and Rachel will be joining the class of the first year class next year. And you two make me proud every single day of the week. And I hope your experience here is as formative for you as it was for me. So when I was thinking about this night, I thought about a couple questions. First, what makes me tick? Second, what this experience really meant. And then third, where, where do I kind of think about things as, having just celebrated my 60th birthday? Um, first, what makes me tick? Um, well, thankfully, it's my heart. Um, <laughs> after a heart attack and a quintuple bypass a little over two years ago, I may have been more likely to have my name wind up on one of these buildings <laughs> than on a nice piece of crystal. So when I say I'm really excited to be here, I really am excited to be here. I'm reminded of the proverb that old age is when you get, have too much room in the house and not enough room in the medicine cabinet. And I can clearly relate to that. Writing a book um, that will be officially released at the end of the month, but you'll all get a copy tonight, um, straddled some pretty significant life events for me and allowed me to think about life. And that experience of putting it down on paper was in itself a great experience. And in short, I really think that I have lived by a very simple concept. In life, there's only one gear, forward, no neutral, and definitely not reverse. I made a living investing in a very capital intensive business that has been defined by booms and busts, and yet my partners and I persevered and created a methodology that took a lot of that volatility out of the business, and in so doing had a part in changing the world, helping to finance a part of the unconventional shale revolution. Kind of amazing for some Stanford liberal arts guys with an MBA. And upon my reflection, my moving forward was definitely not a solitary affair which brings me to Stanford and this experience. Personally, it not only brought me close to this amazing class, but it was also the common denominator connecting me to Richard Rainwater, class of 68, David Albin, class of 85, and Peter Joost, undergrad, class of 80, who's here tonight. In my cold call letter to Richard Rainwater in early 88, looking for a summer job, I doubt he would have answered had I not referenced the GSB prominently, like four or five times in the first line. <laughs> And David Albin, my business partner for almost 30 years, and we did it without a stitch of paper between us governing our relationship. The gifts of those two people in my life can't be understated, and I'll forever be indebted to the GSB. And Peter, you were a great part of that behind the scenes as well. Even as investors, Stanford was important. As we grew our business, the Stanford Endowment became one of our largest investors. The Endowment enjoyed our consistent returns, and that gave me a reason to be on campus frequently. The connection continued as NGP sent over 25 of our associates to the GSB over a 20 plus year period, a small but mighty subset of the Alumni Association, many of whom are here tonight. Not sure why we were such a funnel, but I doubt it was to celebrate fossil fuels and a firm that was spurring along the unconventional shale revolution that was a huge economic engine for the country, enhancing our well-being, liberating our foreign policy, and having the nat natural gas displace coal and bringing down our carbon emissions to an all-time low. I couldn't resist putting that in there. <laughs> but back to Richard Rainwater for just a minute. His role in my life can't be understated either. In fact, the last Arbuckle dinner I attended was in 2010 when he was honored before his devastating disease progressed further. Watching John Dawson and John Scully and Garen Staglin interview him was a memory I'll never forget. Richard's influence helped guide our approach to investing and running our business. Peter allowed me to venue shop 
because when he trashed all my deals, I could wait for Richard to be in a particularly bullish mood and I would do an end run and make sure that Richard got the last word. Officing three doors down from Richard was really a PhD in the school of Richard. He taught us a few things. First, do the right thing. Stay as far away from the foul line as you can, he would say, and care about what they say about you when you're not in the room. Secondly, he would say, get in business with great people you'd trust with your kids, align your interests, and then get out of the way. I tried to live that way and not micromanage, but I have to admit I didn't always succeed. My partners would explain when I got into the micromanagement mode, and they would say, Ken only micromanages if you suck. <laughs> Then Richard would say, form quality relationships by treating all relationships as like you'll see people again and again. Don't just be transactional. If you interact with people over and over again, you'll be more collegial, you'll be more engaged, you'll be more helpful, and you'll build something that lasts. And to this day, when I'm in a meeting, I'll say to myself, what would Richard do right about now? Embrace change, he would say. In chaos, there is opportunity. Go, all you have to do is go find it. And then finally, he would say, think big, Ken. Somebody's got to. Um, and from Richard, I would add, make sure you have fun. And don't be afraid to take a little risk and pick up the phone and make the call. Thank you, Richard, for reading a cold call letter from this first year MBA and proactively calling me and inviting me down to Fort Worth to come see you. Richard was a life enhancer, and I've tried to be one as well. Perhaps my greatest regret is that I feel that I haven't paid it forward enough. But despite challenges, I always look to the future with optimism. As the one-hit wonder philosopher Herm Albright said, a positive attitude may not solve all your problems, but it will annoy just enough people to make it worth the effort. <laughs> so that's why the most important thing for me right now is community. The people that I get to share the journey with make this life meaningful. I've been blessed with tremendous people around me. Professionally, I already highlighted so many, and there are many others. Personally, I've been blessed by fantastic friends, many of whom are here tonight. And I've been blessed to have a, a wonder, had, had a wonderful woman, Julie, in my life, who I met when I was a second year here, who I shared three decades with. And now I've been blessed with the amazing Reagan with whom I get to face the future. I strive to make my community better by being a contributor, not a bystander, a connector instead of a divider, and always a resource to help when I can. I want to leave the world a better place than when I found it. And I realized a few years ago that there was more to life than energy private equity. Imagine that. I guess it was my midlife crisis. Kansas City star writer Bell Tamius defined the midlife crisis as the moment you realize that your children and your clothes are about the same age. And my kids can tell you that's definitely true. But pivoting to the nonprofit sector has been humbling helping a former president further the principles of freedom and opportunity, accountability and compassion, and do it through a model of civility for the country has been gratifying at a very difficult time. President Bush made that challenge personal in his first inaugural when he said, we must live up to the calling we share. Civility is not a tactic or a sentiment. It is the determined choice of trust over cynicism, of community over chaos. I too choose community over chaos. I hope that I can inspire others to keep moving forward and who might have otherwise stalled out. And I hope that I've made Stanford a better place than I found it. Longtime performer Danny Kaye said that life is a big canvas and you should throw all the paint on it you can. I never feel like I've done enough paint throwing, but for now, this will have to suffice. I am humbled and honored by all of you tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. So, Ken, we did a good job teaching you to speak at the GSB. That was <laughs> absolutely fantastic. Um, so I just want to say congratulations again to Ken. It's been an incredible pleasure to have all of you here tonight and to gather everyone for the Arbuckle Award dinner. 
and, um, and to have this chance to celebrate Ken's contributions to Stanford and his career and his legacy. And, uh, and that, that is the end of the dinner. A couple things to say. On the way out, please take the flowers from your tables. I get to say that every time, but go ahead and actually do it this time. And, um, and thank you all for being here. And go, feel, yes, feel free to mingle. And there's a copy of Ken's book, which everyone should get a chance to read, which is maybe in the back to pick up on your way out. No? On the side, on your way out. So when you leave, get a copy of the book. It's, uh, it's well, with, well worth uh, the read. And, um, and what you pay for it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So thank you all for being here tonight. <laughs> is there something else? Did I miss something? We should definitely have a class of 89 picture. Why yes. doesn't the class of 89 come up to the yes. stage and we'll do a class of 89 photo?